So last time we discussed how the matrices E13, E31, E blah blah, E I J act on the weight diagram of a representation of SU3. So remember, this is what a weight diagram looks like. It's a collection of um, lattice points on a hexagonal lattice. Um, I gave some of these special names. So L1 is, is the one that's sort of one along from the origin. L2 is the one that's one up and across from the origin. And L3 is L1 minus, sorry, L, minus L1 minus L2 down here. And I've drawn it in such a way that those three are sort of at the vertices of an equilateral triangle uh, at the center of the origin, just for extra symmetry. So here are the pictures uh, we had for how E13, E31, etc. act. So E13 translates weight spaces up and to the right. So in other words, along the L1 minus L3 direction. E31 translates them back in the opposite direction. E21 and E12 do the same thing along a different axis and E23 and E32 uh, translate up and down. So the claim that I want to make is that actually E31, E13 are part of a subalgebra of SL3C isomorphic to SL2C. So um, E, let, let's do E12 and E21 first. So what is E12 and E21? Well, E12 has a one in position one, two, so it's this matrix. E21 has a position down here, just below the diagonal. And if you sort of ignore everything except the top left two by two block, you can see this is X and this is Y, you know, in that two by two block. So what I'm going to do is stick H into that two by two block and zeros elsewhere. And observe that, you know, just because when we're, we're taking Lie brackets between these things, you know, these extra column and, and row of zeros don't actually affect anything. So for example, the brackets of these two guys equals this guy. So I'll give this one a name. This is H12. Um, so the claim is E12, E21, and H12 span a Lie subalgebra of SL3C, which is isomorphic to SL2. C. In other words, if I just look at these three, I get something isomorphic to SL2C. So all we need to do to, to prove that is to check that the Lie brackets between them are, you know, the same as the Lie brackets would be if this were X, this were Y, and this were H. So that's an exercise. So that holds for 1, 2. It also holds for 1, 3, and for 2, 3. So we get three subalgebras um, of SL3C, each isomorphic to SL2C. So because of this, our representation V splits as a sum of SL2C representations in three ways. Let's right. So it's probably easy to just figure this out in an example. Let's let's take the adjoint representation um, from up here. The adjoint representation here is the uh, the black dots. That's the weight diagram for the adjoint representation. And remember, this dot in the middle is a two-dimensional weight space um, because the that's the diagonal matrices in SL3C. So let's take the uh, subalgebra E13, E31, and H13, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay, so these span a Lie subalgebra 
isomorphic to SL2C. And we know that E13 acts by moving things in this direction. And E31 moves things in the opposite direction. So those are our X and Y. So you, you can see how this decomposes, right? So as a sub as a sum of SL2 representations, we get up here a copy of the standard representation C squared. Down here we get another copy of the standard representation C squared. And across the middle, well, we get a copy of sim2 C squared from the three dots, and then there's one left over in the middle, a trivial representation. Okay, so that's what I mean by V splits as a sum of SL2 representations. And it does it in three ways because we could do the same in the one, two direction. Um, let me copy the picture. So E12 translates things in this direction. E21 translates things in this direction. So what we're getting is, again, a copy of the standard representation across here, a copy of the standard representation down here, and sim2 of the standard representation plus the trivial representation in, in the middle. Okay, so this is splitting as representations of a subalgebra. Now remember, SL2C weight diagrams are symmetric about the origin. And what we're saying is our diagram is symmetric about the origin. In other words, it has a reflectional symmetry about the origin in three different ways. So corollary, any um, weight diagram for an SU3 representation has three lines of reflection symmetry. What are the lines of symmetry? Well, let me get the picture again. So I'm supposed to be able to reflect in a line orthogonal to this one, right? Because I'm allowed to translate in this direction. Everything should be symmetric with respect to the orthogonal of that line, which is this line here. Similarly, I get a reflection around this line and a reflection around this line. And now you can really see why I'm drawing my diagrams using this hexagonal lattice, because I want to have this reflection symmetry with respect to these three axes. And so I'm going to get very symmetrical diagrams. So this symmetry has a name. The symmetry group that acts is called the vial group. And this is, oops. This is called vial symmetry. W E Y L, vial symmetry, the vial group. So let's just do another example. Um, let me copy and paste this, the lines of symmetry draw. So let's, let's look at the standard representation whose weights are here, here, and here. That's like an equilateral triangle. So you can see these three axes are exactly the lines of symmetry of that equilateral triangle, the lines of reflection symmetry. Okay, my diagram's a bit dodgy because I'm not very good at drawing, but it's supposed to be equilateral symmetric with respect to these green lines. So in this case, we, we can see what the group is. The group is isomorphic to the symmetric group on three elements. In other words, the symmetry group of a triangle, equilateral triangle. That has six elements, right? There are three reflections and also three rotations that we get by combining the reflections. So in other words, if we start with some uh, weight 
like say this one, this blue one, that's uh, L1 minus L3. If we know that guy is in our weight diagram, then we know any of the other guys that you get by applying the symmetries to that will also be in the weight diagram. So if we reflect in one green line we get over here, if we reflect in another green line we get over here, and then down here, down here, down here, we get six points in this case, because the group has size six, and none of them fix this point. So that's how we're gonna get our weight diagrams in general. We're gonna pick one vertex of our weight diagram, act using the group to get three or six um, new vertices, and then just sort of connect the dots to get the weight diagram. So in the next video, I'll talk much more about the structure of the weight diagrams for the irreducible representations. And then we'll do some examples of decomposing representations into their irreducible pieces.